Hey everyone, it's Unishek here, and today we're bringing you another Ask343 video about Halo Infinite. In this episode, we've got four members of the Halo Infinite team joining us to talk about our latest Inside Infinite blog. Before we dive into your questions, I'll let each of them introduce themselves and tell you about their role on Halo Infinite. Yeah, thanks, John. My name is Quinn Deloyo, and I'm the lead sandbox designer over here on Halo Infinite. And what that means is I'm just responsible for overseeing the direction on all of the weapons, vehicles, abilities, equipment, items, all that kind of stuff, um, all the toys that the player interacts with. My name is John Mulkey. I'm the lead uh, world designer, which means uh, I uh, run the team that gets the uh, the, the fun of bringing all the pieces together to create the world you're going to explore in Halo Infinite. So sort of uh, running the team where all the rubber hits the road. All the efforts of everybody comes together with uh, with us, making sure we're, we're making it shine. My name is Troy Mashburn. I am the gameplay director on Halo Infinite. So essentially in charge of gameplay across the entire campaign experience. I'm the campaign art lead for Halo Infinite, so um, a lot of my job revolves around kind of ensuring the art quality on the campaign um, is going well and looking awesome for both the fans and you know people who are making the game. Awesome. It's great to have you here today. We're going to be answering a few community questions today. So our first question from Twitter is, the dynamic day-night cycles look fantastic. Can we also expect some degree of dynamic weather? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, part of our job on the art team and the graphics team was to make the ring feel alive, right? And so um, a big part of kind of a living ecosystem is weather, at least on our planet, and we want to emulate that on the ring. So we've definitely added things like there's a really cool wind system, um, which is not just visual, but also audio. We have we have fog systems, you could call them, that come in to different um, altitudes and, and different times of day. Um, we didn't go down the road of having rainstorms and thunderstorms and snowstorms and things like that um, for our launch this year, but uh, we're really excited about the future and what that might mean for things like that. Gotcha. And yeah, day and night is super cool. So yeah. we're looking forward to uh, getting more hands on with all of that. The day night cycle in Infinite looks and sounds amazing. Is time of day going to affect how enemies respond to your presence or change types, groups, numbers of enemies depending on what time it is so when you're moving through the world in the the the, the darker periods um you're going to end up seeing more uh patrols of phantoms you know um moving through the space with searchlights and that kind of thing um which is pretty cool and it like adds kind of an eerie element to what's going on um around you uh you'll probably run into more opportunities where grunts are sleeping on the job um, get the drop on some enemies that way. And then we've done some things to try to kind of emphasize, honestly, just like cool things that would look good in the dark spaces. So we're going with things that have like more emissives on them and that kind of thing. So you'll run into like shield jackals and that kind of thing, because when they put the shields on, um, it looks really cool, you know, in the dark. And it's, I mean, honestly, it's simply because it just looks really cool and it's really fun to fight those in that kind of environment. Um, we put more uh, coils in place and stuff like that because they glow and have really cool effects in the in the darker spaces. Um, enemies with uh, personal shields, that kind of stuff. Those are the kinds of things you'll see as you're going through the, uh, the, the darker areas when it's in the, the nighttime cycles. That is awesome to hear. I actually didn't know about a few of those things that you called out. So looking forward to going back and playing, especially at night, so I can experience some of that for myself. Our next question is actually gonna be about wildlife. Wildlife was confirmed in the last Inside Infinite update. What kinds of wildlife can we expect to see? And will all the wildlife be friendly or will there be some that are hostile to the player and to enemies? So uh, yeah, we will be having uh, wildlife in the environment. Um, we don't have any hostile uh, uh, wildlife in the environment. We wanted to focus the idea on the battle between the Banished and the, the UNSC forces, Chief you know, pushing back, back against that. So we didn't want to bring in the idea that you're, you're fighting the, the ambient population of the ring. Um, but we do have them as an element that really brings the ring to life. You know, you got. We, I think people have seen the Space Gophers. Um, I don't know what the franchise name is that we've gone with those yet, uh, but we call them Space Ghost Gophers leveling, lovingly uh, uh, within the studio. Everybody wants plushies of them, <laughs> which is nice. Um, we have uh, we have some 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 bird 
bird kind of uh, creatures that are they're flying around and stuff like that. Um, some of those uh, will actually draw attention to locations. So if you see birds like circling up in the air, you might go, oh, what's over there? We'll check that out. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, and something that I missed uh, when we talked about day-night cycle, um, some of the uh, wildlife that we have have like a bioluminescence kind of quality to them. Um, and so uh, in the night cycles, you'll see some of those come out and be more prevalent, which looks really cool uh, in the darker spaces too. Wow, I'm uh, learning quite a bit today too. So that's <laughs> very exciting to hear. And I'm sure the community is going to love all of that uh, when they get to go hands on with it too. I'm going to keep us moving on over to our next question though. Uh, this one is, is there a plan to bring back dual wielding in Halo Infinite? Currently, no, that's that's not in the cards right now. And just to, to get into that a little bit is whenever you set out to make a game, the size of Halo Infinite, there's just so many things you can do. I think we have a very talented team where we can do anything, but we can't do everything. And so we needed, we wanted to really focus down on the weapon, the gunplay, the grenades, melee, and where we wanted to put that bet this time was on equipment, bringing equipment back. And so right now, dual willing isn't necessarily there, but that's because we're trying to focus on everything, on all the other things that we're working on. Gotcha. So it's more to just keep the team focused and make sure the stuff that is there is fantastic. That's right. Yeah. Focus on what we have. Yeah, totally. Gotcha. Thank you for that. I'm going to keep us moving along to our next question here. Will there be playable elites in Halo Infinite? Got it. Okay. That's another uh, big question. You know, similar to the last answer, uh, no, the, we're not currently planning on supporting elites as a, as a playable character in Infinite. And the reason is, you know, this is a, a Master Chief story and a Spartan story, especially in multiplayer. We want to make sure that we focus on how Spartans battle against each other and that it feels fair and it's, it's competitive, it's balanced. And, you know, we love elites, but never say never maybe we'll see that one day but right right now the the current plan is you're going to be playing spartans gotcha thank you for diving into that a little bit deeper uh and giving us that explanation there uh our next question will there be weapon upgrades in the campaign i'll say early on we toyed around with that idea of of adding weapon upgrades into the game being able to you know customize your weapons and this started leading us down the road of well you have customized weapons, you're going to want an expanded inventory. And we, we started really heading down this rabbit hole. And they're all features that we liked and we thought were really cool. Um, but the, the game started to veer away from what we felt like Halo was, was all about. And we, we decided instead to take, take a different avenue. So there, there are things in the game that you can, can progress. Um, we hinted a little bit earlier about uh, equipment items that you're going to be able to to unlock as you progress through the game, and you, you'll be able to unlock or uh, sorry upgrade these to uh, improve their capabilities as you go, and and you're also going to be able to find and unlock um, some cool weapon variants, which is which is really exciting as you're getting into these encounters and finding new weapons. Awesome! That sounds super super cool and, and gives you players something to explore throughout the ring and a chance to upgrade equipment. Uh, our next question, you all mentioned being able to hold multiple pieces of equipment in campaign. They're referring to our latest Inside Infinite blog. Uh, does this ability also appear in multiplayer or is that strictly for campaign? The, the current plan and thinking is that you for the, the base multiplayer experience that you need to be able to find and scavenge the equipment that you find and you can only hold it one at a time and you use it and it's gone and you need to find another one. That being said, we're trying to, we are putting plans in place to allow players to customize the game via custom game options like Halo's Legacy where you can be able to hold multiple equipment in the multiplayer custom game that you're creating. So that is the current plan and we'll see if we could uh, make that happen. Gotcha. That's great news uh, and very exciting. Getting to use all the toys uh, in a single match. So thank you for that. I'm going to take us on over to our next question. Is the game going to be open world or semi open world? I, I think that when you talk about open world or semi open world, there's a lot of um, 
you know, preconceived ideas of what that means? Are you going to be out there, uh, you know, gathering leather and crafting and those sorts of things? And that's that's not what we're about. Um, we were inspired very early on from missions like um, Silent Cartographer from uh, Halo Combat Evolved. And, and this mission, um, one of the things that really stuck with me is how how open it was, how much player freedom, player choice you had to decide where you want to go, um, when to engage. It has, you know, you can go inside, you can go outside, you're driving on your Warthog, you're with Marines. Um, so we wanted to, when we talk about rebooting uh, or the, the spiritual reboot of the, the franchise, um, we wanted to capture the essence of this feeling of, of, you know, player choice. And so I think when we talk about world size, um, it's good to understand uh, how we got to the size of the world that we have. Now, if you think about missions, um, you know, in, in game, like in Halo 5, there's a, on Meridian, there's a mission where you're, you're driving a scorpion up a road and, and it's cool, the space is de designed for the scorpion. Um, and once you complete that mission, you leave the scorpion behind and you go on to the next mission. Well, what, what we started asking ourselves is, you know, what if you, could, what if you could keep that scorpion? What if you could drive that scorpion to the next mission and use it again? And then we started taking that further. What if instead of going through the front gate of that mission, you can drive that scorpion up on the hill around the backside and, you know, blow up that, that wraith that's parked there before the enemy even knows you're around. And this, this really like struck a chord with us where um, that, that's what that, that experience that we felt in um, Silent Cartographer really was about. It was about giving me a bunch of toys to play with, putting me in this world where I can choose how and when and where I want to use those toys um, and, and approaching the situation how I like. And so going back to the world's size, we, we expanded the world to account for this kind of combat, for, to account for Halo combat. So we, we have bases that are open. There's a road leading up to the base, but there's also the hillside. And you can follow that road down to another base behind the mountain, but it's all still, it's, it's halo combat. It's, it's not trying to be anything else. And that's what's really exciting to us. It's, it's that expansive combat area that, that you really felt like you had in Silent Cartographer realized now with the, the cool next generation consoles. That's awesome. And I, I always enjoy playing the game uh, in campaign, whether I want to roll up with a tank like you mentioned, or start picking people off from afar, or even just go in guns blazing. It's always a ton of fun. Our next question from the community is, I know that exploration is a major focus of infinite, but what I'm curious about is biomes. What sort of environments, if any, can we expect on Zeta Halo, aside from the Pacific Northwest inspired landscapes we've seen so far? Yeah, another great question. So like I said in the blog, um, we really focused on the legacy um, aspect of the game for the visuals. So Pacific Northwest is our main biome. Um, that was by choice. We got really excited about it. We wanted to do it right. And so within that biome, you actually find um, diversity within sub biomes. So we have some high altitude um, palettes. We have some more wetland palettes, more swampy wetlands. Um, we also have some war-torn areas. Uh, we refer to those as the Deadlands, um, where you can really see some storytelling going on with the with the biome itself and maybe what happened on the ring. Um, along with our biomes, we have a lot of other palettes, right? We have um, the hexagons themselves lead, them, lead to some really interesting kind of visual and gameplay situations of having, you know, a cavern made out of hexagons or uh, speaking of caves, we actually have cave systems in the game as well. So you can go exploring in some really dark kind of uh, moody areas and, and see what you can uh, discover. Um, we have the Forerunner architecture. You go inside the Forerunner uh, with that classic palette. And then the Banished themselves bring this like plethora of 
really interesting um, architecture and buildings and fortifications. And so when you, you put all these things together, it adds a lot of variety in a very natural way, I'll say. So it doesn't feel like you're at Disneyland where you're, you know, you're running around and you're seeing these very um, intricate new biomes that don't really mesh well together. So we really focused on getting that Pacific Northwest biome and then having these sub biomes within it. So it all feels like one believable place for the player to kind of engage with. Gotcha. So like a diversification of that Pacific Northwest biome, right? Yeah. Just a whole bunch yep. of stuff inside it. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot of variety within, within it. Yes. But it is all kind of contained in that Pacific Northwest theme for the most part. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Our next question here is, I'm curious about how or if the hexagonal pillars have changed. I don't know if I missed them, but I didn't see them in any of the new screenshots. Yeah, the hexes are, are still around. They're one of our early decisions around the game of having kind of this underlying structure. I think I mentioned this in the blog, this underlying structure in on the ring itself. And again, this has allowed us to go in this path of having massive destruction on the ring without it becoming really noodly and noisy and, and complex. Um, and we have these organized hexes that have been shifted up and down and kind of torn apart. And some of them are missing, creating these big gaps between spaces. Um, and so they're still in the game. They're still foundational kind of under literally underlying on the surface of the game and the world that we're creating. Um, we've continued to kind of work on their rendering. That was one of the things that's always bothered us in the past was just how they looked on screen. And so we've made a lot more investment into their shaders and how they render and how they're grouped and things like that. Um, but again, they lend so well to both just the, the narrative of the destruction of the ring and then also gameplay. Like a hexagon is a really, really convenient shape for gameplay to kind of live on and, and play around um, for cover and for, you know, using the grapple and getting up on these shelves of hexes. Um, so yeah, they're still around um, in the same kind of fashion that they were last year, but uh, they're looking a lot better right now. That's great to hear. I'm sure the person who asked that's going to be very, very happy to hear that <laughs> as <so>. well. <laughs> you touched on it some in the blog, but how will missions and other objectives be separated from each other in a more connected world? What is stopping me from grabbing a Banshee and flying it to an objective three missions ahead in the story? Um, in a way, the answer is do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, go do it. Uh, the way that the game is structured and the way that the like the primary narrative moves through the game, there's certain things that just naturally by the structure of the game, sort of you don't have the opportunity to jump ahead and sort of sequence break and, and break the experience. The game embraces this to a to a degree. But on top of that, um, once again, going back to sort of the, the player agency aspect of that, you know, you're the, the, the way it's going to play out is you might be dropped off in a location from the Pelican and there's your primary objective. You can see over the ridge that there's a location that you're going to be heading to. Um, but then off to the left, there's a, a UNSC forward operating base that's now been overrun by Banished. Oh, do I go down there before I go to the main main story beat or and, and, and take that back? And then maybe I can pull in a vehicle to go use. I can... Uh, uh, gather up different, you know, my loadout, change out my loadout to what I want to do from the things that I've unlocked. Um, I look over to the right and, oh man, there's some green smoke popped that's that's coming over that ridge over there. That's probably a, a group of uh, Marines that are uh, heavily, bat you know, battling for their lives against banished forces right now. I can go choose to rescue those guys. That would be something to do. And then over there, there's a big forerunner tower sticking up over that 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 ridge across the, across the gap. Maybe I want to go explore that and go see what's going on there. Um, so there's a lot of choice that you get to make about kind of how you want to engage in things and what you want to go do and what stories you want to go uh, pursue at any given time. But then there's always sort of the anchor element of the, the core story that's playing through that is ever present and kind of drawing you through the spaces and through the world as it, as it un un unfolds in front of you. Gotcha. So a player can't really cut ahead on the the main golden path storyline they but they can still go around and adventure and explore and find all these other cool things absolutely and we've 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 managed to craft that in such a way that it's not um it's not done through the concept of like invisible walls and just you know you just can't do it yet kind of stuff it's 
we've crafted the story in such a way that it's very uh, natural in the flow of how the spaces work and how the how everything's flowing. So it doesn't feel artificial, which I think is important um, when you're having this kind of a experience that we want to have be this flowing, organic kind of feeling experience. There's roads connecting these different mission locations, and you can you know grab a vehicle and you can drive from one location to the other. Um, which is awesome. You can drive that at your own pace. Now, Master Chief's story, the main story of the, uh, the game, uh, does have a, a linear thread that takes us through the world. And as you're progressing through the story, you're going to unlock you know, new areas to explore, new uh, locations to, to go inside. And that, that story will, will progress in a linear fashion. In between, as you're as you're driving out and about, there are many other activities out in the world for you to engage in, and like the the, the bases or outposts is one of those things that I that I had mentioned. And there you can, if if you've um, progressed the game and you've you've unlocked, you know, maybe some of these higher tier vehicles could be the Scorpion, it could be a flying vehicle. Um, you you're absolutely free to to take that vehicle to any place you want to go in the game and you can use it to attack a base or you could go in on foot if you've um, you know rescued some marines along the way you could go in there and take some marines with you it's the choice is yours it's it's awesome <laughs> yeah so you could play any way you want but you still kind of have to follow that that chief storyline and there's no no cuts no skipping ahead right exactly okay. this next question is with Zeta Halo being a major character, will there be ways to find story elements within the world beyond the Golden Path? Yes, absolutely. Um, like I said, the locations are, are connected in the, in the world. You can drive from one location to the other. And along the way, you're gonna discover, you know, cool elements in the world. You'll see a, you know, a, a pelican that's crashed and skidded across the terrain and it's, you know, burnt out an area. Well, you, you can go over and discover, you know, explore that space. And um, some of these spaces, you're going to find things like audio logs. And those audio logs are going to be telling a lot more story about the ring, about what happened, about the, the battles that took place here, or people's personal stories. So it, it's, it's really exciting to go around and explore some of these locations. And I'll also say like the art team has done an amazing job of just set dressing these areas. So you can look at a space and you can really see what goes on. And then when you listen to that audio log, it just complements that that story and just really makes the, the world a much uh, deeper, richer space for exploring that. It's really cool. So they paint the picture and then you kind of get to hear more about it essentially. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the, the the audio logs like are great. You know, there's great voice acting and and background sounds. It's like a cool radio drama. It's just, they're awesome. They're really well done. All right, I'm gonna toss us to our next question here. Is the ring in the skybox a fully rendered 3D model? If so, why did you decide to make it a 3D model instead of just painting a skybox? It looks beautiful, by the way. Yeah, great question. We chose to go with a 3D model mostly because the ring, again, in the blog, we described the ring as a character. Um, being a character, we want it to have attributes that the player can, they're not they are not gonna slap you in the face, but they're, they're subtle, right? So uh, you think of a 3D model in the sky, and as you move across the world, you're gonna see it from different angles, right? Even though it's the same thing each time. And so we were able to kind of give different attributes to it in a 3D model versus if it were just a 2D in the sky um, painting, you don't really get that uh, that parallaxing play of shapes and, and kind of details. And so making it a 3D model allows us to do that. Um, it also allows us to bridge the gap of when you're on the when you're on the gameplay space island and you're looking off across the world, um, you can kind of see where it connects back to the ring and then goes up into the sky. And like that, 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 I'll call it that 3D-ness um, is really compelling and it's really awesome. And then it plays really well with our day-night day cycle. So you see the day-night cycle, you know, the, the star, the light source sun 
rises and you can see the shadows on the ring kind of change based because it's a 3d model and it's actually casting shadow um so it just it just allows us some for some really cool stuff um the other the other really neat feature there is at a certain time in the day um the, the cycle rather um there's an eclipse and so the the ring actually eclipses the sun and you get this like midnight feel so it's pretty brief but it's really neat kind of moment um while you're playing and so having a 3d model allows us to do kind of really interesting things like that that um that's exciting to me and all of that is because you went with that 3d model instead of yeah. the painting yeah yeah that that just allowed us to do a bunch of that stuff that i was uh, rambling through there <laughs> Awesome. Uh, that actually brings me to uh, my next question. How will the day-night cycles work with cutscenes? Will they also be integrated into them, or will they always be in a predetermined time? This is a good one. Uh, this is awesome. I'm glad somebody asked this because um, it'll be a great point of clarification. Um, in Halo Infinite, we don't do what might be considered traditional cutscenes so much because um, there's not like pre-rendered things. Everything's done live in the engine. And we, we, we really focused on the idea of like doing smooth transitions. So Chief will move into a, a particular interaction and the camera kind of pulls from the head and transitions into the, the, the scene, but everything is playing out right in the space. So whatever time of day it is, it's gonna be that. Um, whatever weapons you have in your hands, those are the ones in the cutscene. Um, so, and then it'll transition back out and continue on playing. We are really looking to try to present that sort of seamless, experience as you're going through. So we didn't have that sort of game cutscene, back to game cutscene um, kind of experience. We wanted it to flow and just have the story just play out as the experience of the player. So um, there won't really be any differentiation. It will be live happening in engine whenever it happens. That is great to hear. Just a very smooth flow from cutscenes to gameplay and back and forth. Yep. Fantastic. All right. In a Keep us jumping on over uh, to our next question. What techniques does the team implement to really bring out the scale of the world of Zeta Halo? Emphasis on certain elements, et cetera, et cetera. That is a great question. One of the challenge we, challenges we have with making a world that is both alien and ginormous, like the ring, um, <laughs> yeah, that's my science word, um, is that scale can get really tricky, right? Because you want to build this giant ring that um, that implies all this other space that you can literally see, you know, wrapping up around you. You have these large or huge um, forerunner structures all over. And so how do you make it so that you as a player don't feel like a little kid in this space? You want to feel like a super soldier, right? You don't want to feel like a, a small person running around this big space. Um, but those features are so um, important. Those giant features are so important to kind of the epic scale of um, of, a, of a gameplay space. So um, one of the challenges we have and one of the reasons why, again, we lean on any biome that we create in a game is it brings back scale to the player, right? And so you look at grass or you look at trees, they, people can use those to, to judge scale against a giant form or structure. If you see that structure alone, without anything around it, it's really hard to tell what the scale of that thing is. So you need things to be able to compare it to within the same kind of shot. And that's where it gets really fun kind of blending all the different palettes, I'll call them, together in order to get those varying degrees of scale across the game. And so, you know, you saw in some of our screenshots, there's these big m mega structures in the world and you'll see next to them, there are trees. And these trees are not small, because as people, we know a pine tree is, say, 20 to 30 feet tall. It's like a, a random guess, right? Because uh, we can relate to those things in the real world. And um, and then seeing those together, your brain can put it together. Oh, my gosh, this thing must be a mile high or something, you know, whatever you might uh, come up with. And so scale is a really, a really tricky thing to pull off well. Um, but it really comes down to mixing the different relatable things with like the big science awesome or um, sci-fi awesome things in the world, like the megastructures. Uh, the hexagons even lend themselves to having scale. They're kind of more of a medium scale, but they create these big swaths of um, forerunner tech that you see in the world. And so you see those compared to like the the rocks on top of them to the trees on top of those. And you start really getting a good sense of, of what the scale is of spaces and the distances of things too. 
And um, it's a really fun challenge for the team to kind of overcome. And when you do it well, people won't really realize that that was an issue ever. But um, yeah, it's just it's kind of an exciting topic for us to always uh, tackle with with making a really awesome sci fi game. That's an incredible explanation. It's all just a matter of perspective and making sure people can relate these different sizes uh, against yeah. each other. Yeah, so it's huh. not so alien that, you know, you can't relate to it, but it's also, you know, epic and awesome and, you know, visually interesting, you know, sci-fi opera type stuff. <laughs> that is uh, an awesome explanation. Thank you for diving into that. Uh, I'm sure that person is very happy with that answer, too. <laughs> hope so. Uh, I'm going to jump on over to our next question and keep us moving here. What's the design philosophy for the Banished in Halo Infinite? What colors, styles, and goals go into banishing a hallway, weapon, vehicle, or structure? Yeah, really good question. Well, uh, Banished were first established, the visuals for them first established in Halo Wars 2, and so we've really taken that and kind of applied it to the, to the narrative of this game. And so the Banished have this really heavy metal um, red war paint kind of aesthetic to them. Um, they're literally led by a brute, so they have this, you know, brutish um, kind of vibe. And um, and so you'll see this in the way we built kind of their their structures and their fortifications in that they all have these big spikes under them. And so what's happened is the Banished have dropped them from orbit and they've slammed into the ground and they built these fortifications across the ring uh, in this very kind of... Um, not medieval, but very, you know, very um, heavy way, right? And so it has this really awesome contrast versus like this beautiful world, Pacific Northwest world that we built, um, where you see like you see these beautiful trees and these things, and then you just have these big heavy buildings having slammed down on the ground around them, crushing everything below them um, to kind of um, set up their fortifications, uh, the banished. So, um, it really, it's a, it's a great way for us to contrast against things. And you can even see that in some of the vehicle and weapon, uh, you know, new designs of classic weapons and some of the new weapons in that, you know, you look at the Wraith or you look at the Banshee and now those things, they have this heavy metal plated armor on top of them with the red war paint of the Banished. So you can really feel like this, this faction has come and kind of um, affected the ring visually um, both with like their their equipment, their vehicles, weapons, and then also their buildings and just the fact that they don't care about, you know, they don't care about the beauty of the ring. They just want to conquer things. And so even within some of our Forerunner structures, you can see their kind of influence of what they're trying to do with the Forerunner technologies and um, how they're applying, applying their way on top of those things. So, um, yeah, it's really exciting for us uh, aesthetically and, and visually for the art team to kind of tackle these things and really get that contrast in there so players can can see the story of what's happening and what they're up to. Great explanation there. Uh, I don't think I've met anyone who doesn't like the banished uh, uh, color scheme and, and just overall art style. So uh, I'm looking forward to letting people dive in, explore the ring and see all that banished influence. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited, really excited for people to go and get to explore all that stuff because we put a lot of a lot of cool details in there that I think people will appreciate if they look around. Awesome. Thanks for answering that one. Uh, oh. Let's dive into our next one. In Halo Infinite, will we be able to knock things off the edge of Zeta Halo? Asking for a friend. <laughs> I, the, the answer is yes. And um, I, <laughs> I can tell you, um, just, just recently I was playing in space and... I, I happened to be driving in with a, a Scorpion tank and I came around the corner and I was face to face with a Wraith and just out of pure pure luck, pure coincidence, I managed to <laughs> I managed to push the Wraith over the edge and just watched it, you know, slowly tilt back and just fall into the abyss, which which was amazing, unexpected, and it was just such a cool moment that happened that, you know, that just by luck that I managed to to come around a different way and catch them off guard. So absolutely, you can you can push things off the the edge. Um, it's going to be difficult, but if you manage to time it just right, you know, you're gonna see it. <laughs> I hope you have that recorded because I want to take a look, and I'm sure everyone else <laughs> wants to take a look at that too because it sounds very 
uh, unique, right? That's never yeah. been a thing in a Halo game before. So very, very exciting. Our next question from the community is, how much of the improvements to visual quality do you attribute as a response to the July reveal versus just having more time to improve and tweak the game? Yeah, that's a really great question. First off, thank you to the community for having um, giving us their, their thoughts and on what they saw last year. Uh, we really appreciate that, and that's something we have that not every franchise gets to have, is that, that immediate feedback on how people are feeling about it. Um, a lot of what was brought up uh, from the community based on that uh, that gameplay reveal last year was a lot of stuff we had on our list of like, hey, we need to improve these things. Um, we are so grateful we now have more time to do that. And you can hopefully everybody can tell in the screenshots we just released, we really took that feedback and just that list of things that we knew we were going after or wanted to go after um, to heart. And the team has worked incredibly hard. I can't state that enough on on getting those features and those issues resolved as best as we can um, for the sake of the player, right? That's always what this is about. And so um, hopefully you can see the you can see the results of that effort. But again, thank you to the community for for pointing out things that, you know, we completely agree with. Um, and we were able, again, with our with our extra time here, we're able to actually go after and fix and I think it's going to lead to something really awesome um, when you get to play it later this year. I've always said it's going to be a beautiful game. Uh, I have, I've always had that faith, and, and it's definitely been coming along quite nicely. So thank yeah. you for answering that. Our next question here, will all the events in the game be created in advance, like outposts and missions, or will there be random encounters like unscripted patrols that will look for Chief? Gotcha. Yeah. So when the Banished arrived on Zeta Halo and established their presence, they uh, they set up outposts and, and bases and these kinds of things as like permanent structures that they're entrenched upon uh, within. Uh, but then there's also these uh, patrols that are out in the in, be in the in between spaces um, and uh, random encounters that the player will run into as you're as you're exploring and, and going between locations. Um, there's on top of that um, something that's pretty cool is we have a system in place to react to the some of the choices the player makes so for instance if you're moving through a space and you're on foot um we we will we will understand that and the random encounters you might run into are uh encounters that would be fun to engage in on foot um it, and if you're like coming into a space and you've got a flying vehicle for instance and you're just cruising through you might run into a, an encounter that's fun to fight against in a flying vehicle um i want to emphasize that the goal there is to make it so that it, we're giving you things that are fun to engage with with whatever you're bringing to bear and the choices you've made it's not sort of a a reaction pushback you know oh the player's in a flying vehicle let's punish them <laughs> it's not really that it's the idea of like what is really fun to do with with this kind of a choice that the player's made and we make sure that we're providing those kinds of opportunities so that uh so that it feels really cool and it feels rewarding for the choices you've made that's awesome i actually am very excited to see our players go hands-on and see these different experiences could you actually expand on that if you we've got some time here uh could you expand on what that means for players yeah, absolutely. Um, so in, for instance, like in uh, previous Halo games, you'll get uh, uh, more of a linear experience where things are crafted specifically for that experience. So if you're going to have an experience where this is where the player gets a hold of a wasp, let's make a really cool, you know, what would be fun to do in a wasp? You know, uh, uh, if I'm coming in with a scorpion, what would be cool to do in a scorpion? Um, and in our our game, things are a little bit open, in, in infinite. It's it's more open ended than that. And so we want to still be able to present those those opportunities where if a player perchance comes into this encounter with a scorpion, we want to have cool, fun things that you would do when you're in a scorpion. You know, we want to make sure that you have those elements and that we have that kind of a, a play experience. If I come into this space perchance in a wasp, um, we want to make sure that there's. Uh, what would be fun to do in a wasp is presented to you. Um, so it's trying to preserve all that really fun kind of uh, crafted thematic gameplay elements that you would get in a more linear experience and applying it to this more open-ended approach um, and ensuring we still have those fun opportunities. So it adapts to just keep things fun and interesting no matter how you play the game. 
Yeah, yeah. The the game is so much of this game is is anchored in the idea of player agency and choice. You know, play it the way you want to do it. Figure out what you want to do, and 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 the game will support uh, reacting to those choices and, and presenting you with fun opportunities. So it's pretty cool. That that does sound pretty darn cool. All right, this one's a little more lighthearted. It says, "Are you guys having fun making the game?" You know, just to to level said, making games is not. Um, at times it's, it's difficult for sure. I mean, especially a game like this, there's all sorts of, uh, philosophical, uh, things you need to challenge both internally and also externally with fans. And, and for me, I'm super grateful just to be able to work on a game like Halo, to have a bunch of fans that love the game. And there's, there's challenges with that. But to answer your question succinctly, like, hell yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. Like this is Halo Infinite. This is a big deal. And the team that I'm working with, we we love working on this game. And we put all of our passion and and blood and sweat and tears into this game. And at times, yeah, it's been difficult, but that's not me complaining. We love this. Like this is an awesome place and an awesome game to be working on. And we are so excited to be able to get this thing out for everyone else to be checking it out. Awesome. Uh, that's great to hear. I'm having fun making the game, helping out and learning as much as I can. So I'm glad to hear that you guys are also having fun over there on the Sandbox team. It was awesome to have you back here today. Before we let you go though, do you have any closing words that you'd like to impart with the community? I'd just like to say thanks again for, for having me here, John. Appreciate all the work that you do. And and I'll always I'll always come back on the show or, or talk to you at any time. So that's, that's not a problem. But for the community, uh, thanks for being along with this ride. And I hope to be talking and interfacing with, with all of you as much as I can and as much as we can at 343 for the upcoming months as we get this baby out the door. I know all of us here are eternally grateful for uh, and humbled by your continued interest and following of the of, of, of Master Chief and his adventures and the things that we're, we're putting together to, to explore together. Um, that's great, you know, and, and the, the questions you've posed today uh, you know, just reinforce that, you know, that there's interest in what we're doing and you want to know more. And I can't wait until you guys get this in your hands and, uh, you know, uh, get a chance to experience it. And I'm really looking forward to the different stories um, that you experience and share uh, YouTube and, you know, online and and uh, and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, just a big thank you. And uh, maybe I'll see you in co-op. Thank you for being the community, right? Um, it's something that Halo has and we appreciate the passion that goes behind, um, you know, you taking the time and, and investing in our success and hopefully the experience you get to play later this year. And um, it's really awesome and humbling to see the responses we get when we are able to share stuff with you. So I'm really excited about being able to share more with the community as we go and kind of changing that culture of developer and, and community um, that we're able to do now. And uh, yeah, just a huge thank you. And also a thank you to the team for working so hard. It's, it's just an immense amount of time goes into making these games. So being able to see a positive reaction from the community really makes our work um, feel good. Yeah. John, thank you very much for having me here today. And, um, you know, I feel very fortunate to have this opportunity to, to speak, you know, directly to the community and share some of our, um, you know, passion for for making this game like we all we all love this game we all grew up with this game um i feel very fortunate to be a part of it and to to bring the community in along with it as well so yeah thank thank you the community very much for uh for giving us giving me this opportunity thank you so much for the time today gentlemen uh i appreciate it and i know the community does as well for everyone watching if you want to stay up to date with the latest and greatest Halo news, be sure to follow at Halo on Twitter and check our news section on halowaypoint.com. Until next time, I'll see you all later.